Okay, so that was how 0 and 1 forms are defined. Now let's use some of this to construct a 2 form. So I'll remind you that a 1 form, omega, we could express as the linear combination of the 1 form basis vectors, which we understood as being the exterior derivative of our coordinate 0 forms. And then I introduced to you the notion of the wedge product, which on two one forms is going to produce a two form but we have to be really careful to respect the anti-symmetry of the wedge product. So let's explore this anti-symmetry a little bit more now and it's actually going to be very important when we talk about two forms. For one forms it doesn't matter because we only have one form we can't swap it with anything so we're never going to need to worry about this anti-symmetry. But for two forms it's going to come into play massively as we'll see now. So let's consider our two form, zeta, which I said was omega wedge tau, and let's get an expression for this in terms of the basis. So if I just substitute our two one forms written in terms of the basis, so I've just expanded each of these in the basis, now this wedge product, I haven't told you, but it has to be linear and these components are, are just going to be numbers or functions if it's a one form field. Um, I'll talk more about this later, but for now let's just treat these as being numbers or functions. They can be pulled out of the wedge product since the only kind of form part of these dx's. So this whole thing I can just rewrite like this. And now this object here, this omega mu tau nu with two indices, I could just relabel as now our two form, zeta. I could just call this zeta mu nu with two indices now. And this is the expression for our two form. Well, not quite. We need to realize something now. We're using the summation convention just implicitly. I'm implying a sum here over mu and nu. But a lot of the terms in this sum we're actually going to discover are either redundant or they vanish. So for simplicity's sake now, let's consider the case of R2. So we're going to consider a two form over R2. Now what does it mean to be over R2? Well essentially it just means that our indices are going to be two dimensional, they're going to run from one to two. So I could now begin by writing out all the terms in this sum, since we're in two dimensions it's going to be simple and we can begin to explore what happens to them. So if I were to just fully write out now zeta using the sum convention, the first term will be 1, 1, dx1 wedge dx1. And now let's realise something about this term, it's actually going to vanish. This dx1 wedge dx1, we know by anti-symmetry. Okay, so this is just using the anti-symmetry of the wedge product. We pick up a minus sign, but now we can quite happily say this whole expression has to vanish because something times itself can't be equal to the negative of that same something times itself. The whole thing just has to vanish. So by anti-symmetry, dx1 wedge dx1 vanishes. So the dx1, dx1 term is going to vanish, and by a similar argument the dx2, dx2 term is going to vanish. So if we were now trying to think about our components of this zeta mu nu, say in terms of a matrix or just an array of numbers, the zeta11, one, one, remember this is zeta11, one, one, zeta21, two, two, sorry, zeta21, zeta22, two, two. these are just the components. The off diagonals are going to vanish. And now let's see what happens to the. Sorry, the diagonal components are going to vanish. And now let's see what happens to these off diagonal components. So the next term in the sum is going to be 
well, the one more time has vanished, but Zeta 1, 2, DX1, Wedge, DX2. Okay, and then the next term will be Zeta 2, 1, DX2, Wedge, DX1. And then the Zeta 2, 2 term vanishes. Okay, so on the face of things now, this looks like two separate components. But what we need to realize is that DX1 wedge DX2 is really the same thing as this DX2 wedge DX1. Because of the anti-symmetry, I can just swap these and pick up a minus sign. So really by writing this down, I'm not giving any new information. This component is effectively redundant since it's just related to this component, but with a minus sign. So really the way to state that is that this Zeta 2-1 component is just not independent, it's redundant, and it just has to be equal to the negative of this component, since I can just swap the dx's and pick up a minus sign. So this component is redundant, I don't need to bother writing it down, and I just say now that my components are Zeta 1-2, and what I previously would have written as Zeta 2-1 is just the negative of Zeta 1-2. So now we should realize when we write down, in this case, a two form, we've written it using the sum convention. We have to introduce an extra factor in the sum convention to account for this over counting, because essentially we're having more terms in the sum, which are just redundant because they're related by the anti-symmetry. So what I should really write is that zeta now as a two form is equal to one half times. So that would be for a two form. For an arbitrary degree form, I would have an expression something like this. Okay, so we'll probably come back to this, but we just need an extra factor of Q factorial to deal with this overcounting that's happening due to the sum convention. We could also, instead of just writing this factor to account for the overcounting, we could just kind of modify our sum convention a little bit and say that rather than summing over mu and nu, we instead sum over mu less than nu. So if I write an expression here, zeta mu nu, we're summing over mu less than nu, so my index mu always has to be less than nu. The only terms which I could write here are one, two. So this just accounts for the overcounting which is introduced by the sum convention and the fact that when we write dx2 wedge dx1, it's really the same thing as minus dx1 wedge dx2. Okay, so all of this is just to demonstrate how two forms, well, on the, the surface of things, might have d times or d squared components. Say, for example, in two dimensions, we have a four by four matrix of components but because of the anti-symmetry and the, and yeah, because of the anti-symmetry, a lot of these components become redundant or vanish. So a two form in two dimensions only has one component. And now we can do similar constructions. We could say go to three dimensions. We would find in three dimensions that a two form only has three components. And we could go even further. We can realize now that certain forms can only exist in spaces of a uh, higher dimension. We couldn't, for example, define a two-form in one dimension. Well, this is intuitively clear because we only have one coordinate to work with. We would just have x1. We couldn't even write down x2. But in higher dimensions, this can be argued by having more components. Everything just has to vanish by anti-symmetry. So this anti-symmetry we're starting to see is very, very crucial to these differential forms, and it's going to be cropping up all over the place, and we need to be really careful with how we deal with these expressions. Okay, so this was just a little introduction to differential forms on the space Rd. I'm going to go into a bit more detail next time about how differential forms on R3 completely generalise notions from vector calculus, which you're probably familiar with, and then we'll continue to 
go forward and talk about differential forms in the manifold context, where we realise that differential forms are dual vectors or the dual object to vectors. But for now, I'll just summarise what we covered today. I introduced differential forms as just a new abstract quantity. We realised that zero forms are just a re-identification of functions. Then I introduced a new piece of machinery known as the exterior derivative, which we found maps a Q form into a Q plus one form. And we then used that to identify what the one form basis vectors are. They're essentially just the exterior derivative of our coordinate functions. And then from one forms and using the new wedge product, being really careful about the anti-symmetry property of the wedge product, I showed you how we can get an expression for the components of a two-form in two dimensions. And we saw how a lot of the components become redundant or vanish due to this anti-symmetry.